Um, I know everybody's been, either has been waiting for 20 minutes or just arrived, and we're all anxious to hear Marianne Byrne, but there are a few thank yous and announcements that need to be made. The first, of course, is a thank you to Marianne for coming down today, and uh, we're quite glad that Lena Gilbert was able to drive her. Uh, the basics, the restrooms, you exit, take a right, and take another right. Thanks to the Public Library's co-sponsorship and to the work of Cody, who is videotaping this, some of you don't need to be directed to the bathroom because you know where it is because you're sitting in your own homes. And uh, welcome to you also. And Cody can zoom in on our website and our address if anyone has any comments or questions. There will be questions and af answers afterwards, after Marianne speaks, and there will also be refreshments. And also, this program will be available. Uh, copies of it will be. And copies have already been promised to the University of Iowa Women's Archive, to Hillel, to Temple Judah, to Aguda Sahim for their library, and to an archive in New York, and to Drake Library. And so copies are available to interested individuals and organizations. Uh, I need to thank the synagogue and Hillel for being co-sponsors and lending uh, material and logistic support. Special thanks to Rabbi Jeff and to Kim, the secretary who has the magic touch with the copy machine. Uh, I, my husband asked me not to thank him because he said, I'm sitting here in the room, you thanked me enough. But I need to thank him and my cats. And if anyone has never organized anything, doesn't already know, if the people who live in the house are organizing a project, the dishes do pile up. So um, my home life deserves a lot of thanks for putting up with the chaos that ensues while one is trying to be organized about an event. I also have to thank someone who isn't here today, which is who is Ch Professor Charles Vernoff, who introduced me to Marianne and her husband quite a few years ago. And he said, there are some people I'd like you to meet. There's a concert. Why don't you come over for dinner? And I confess, I knew he was making tuna noodle casserole and that I was a vegetarian and we were having a really busy day. So we got there just at the very end of the meal in time to walk to the concert. And a little internal alarm went off that went ding, ding, ding. These are really important people. I wish I had gotten here sooner. And many years have gone by, and I said hello to Marianne many times at classical music concerts and at concerts of her son. And last year, I know this day, she was at her daughter Jennifer's congregation, Jennifer's a cantor, and uh, her son escorted her there. And that kind of set off the idea, oh, that's 69 years. Next year's a milestone, and I've got an idea for an event, and Marianne wouldn't have to schlep on an airplane. So uh, schlep is Yiddish for, anyway, if we say any Jewish words that you're not Jewish and don't understand, please don't hesitate to ask. The Jewish community does not own Kristallnacht, and there will be some Jewish references in the talk and in my introduction, but don't let that alienate you. I was thinking about history and about 70 years. I confess I haven't been on this planet for 70 years. And I was thinking about last Tuesday and about our president-elect's acceptance speech and how he mentioned a 106-year-old woman and talked about all the things she's seen. Then I couldn't help but think about being in junior high and thinking, history seems boring. I think they should teach it backwards, talk about where we are, and then look back so understand how it connects to us. And 70 years is a long time. It, it's a lifetime for some people. But it's also the blink of an eye. And being a early baby boomer, Tuesday night, seeing people celebrating in Grant Park, I couldn't help but think about 1968, when in that same park, people were getting beaten up and tear gassed and thinking, well, that's 40 years. That went by in the blink of an eye. And how did 38 look from 68? It was closer than 68 is from now. And we all know, however old we are, that time flies. So we're really uh, grateful 
to be here today. Also, as a boomer, sometimes I get terrified that my generation, our generation, will be the oldest people on earth. And I'm very happy that there are, is a generation or two older than us. And we are all witnesses today as we hear Marianne tell her story. We are witnesses, so no one can say that didn't happen. Because we can say in 70 years, if we're still alive, or in 30 years, or whenever we have a chance. No, I met someone who told me this story, and I believe her. And I had coffee with her. And it was Sunday afternoon, and I was in Iowa City. And it was the exact day, plus 70 years, to things that happened to her. Um, I thanked Charles, and I guess I have to thank Audrey for introducing me to Charles. And I need to thank my mother for all the bedtime stories and for instilling in me an absolute love of stories. You might wonder what Any Road Productions is, and it's really something I made up with my husband, but um, this library has morphed, but this meeting room A has been here, and I, I feel like I've been standing in this room doing different programming for many, many decades, which is um, a peculiar avocation, but such, such it is, that's what I'm called to do. Now we're about to commence the program, and before Marianne speaks, we are going to do something that is customary in the Jewish community and invite those who are not Jewish to stretch your mind and join us. We uh, tend to light candles memorializing deaths more than birthday candles, just one of those things. And we have some memorial candles here and some people have been invited to come up and light candles, just a symbolic remembrance of people who died. So if you're one of those people, Marianne will light the first candle, and the rabbi and some other people who we've talked with are here, and we have uh, actual box matches, very low tech. So uh, could you please come on up and stand behind the table? and? Um, Right now, the cameras are on me, but he'll be switching over to the table. And because Marianne is shorter than I am, she'll be over there so we could see her. You can see right now on the projector, as people are coming up, I'll tell you, um, that is the synagogue that was destroyed 70 years ago today. So um, the rabbi will explain the prayer, but basically what we are saying is as long as we live, they too will live, for they will live in us as long as we remember them. And we, in our lives, are carrying the memories of somebody else's memory. So do you want to go first, Jeff? Uh, Marianne will go first. Did Steve provide the matches? OK, yeah, yeah. Let's rise as the candles are being lit, and then we'll follow up the candle lighting with uh, Jerry Sorokin chanting Eil Malay Rachamim. Hey, Jeff. And then we'll follow the candle lighting with Jerry chanting Eil Malay Rachamim, and then we'll all join in Mourner's Kaddish, and I'll pass out some Kaddish sheets. And as we're mourning, we're not just talking about today, but I, as a lot of the PR said, um, today really is, or the, the, the night of broken glass was the beginning of of the destruction of the Jewish community and the little prelude to World War II, even though, of course, we know that Germany invaded Poland in 39, but this was the prelude. So, ladies first.
off with matches. El male rachamim shochen ba meromim hametzem nuchan echonat achat kanfei hashchina bemalot kedoshim utehorim kezohar haraki amazhirim. Lenishmot kol achenu b'nei Yisrael shenit bechuva shoa anashim nashim v'taf shenechnechu v'shenisrefu v'shenehergu shemasru et nafsham al kiddush Hashem began eden tehim enuchatam ana ba'al harachamim. Hastirem besete knafecha leolamim. Utsoror bitsor hachayim et nishmotehem. Adonai hu nachalatam. Veyanuchu veshalom al mishkevotehem. Venomar. Amen. Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the souls of our brethren who perished in the Shoah, men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered and suffocated and burned to ashes. May their memory endure and inspire deeds of charity and goodness in our lives. May their souls thus be bound up in the bond of life. May they rest in peace and let us say amen. Be'alma divra chirute v'yamlich malchute v'chayechon uv'yomechon uv'chaye d'chol b'et Yisrael ba'agala uv'izman kari v'imru amen yehe shmei rabba mevarach le'olam l'almei almaya yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitpa'ar v'yitramam v'yitnase v'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalal shmei d'kut shabrichu Leila min kol birchata veshirata tushbechata venechemata da amiran be'alma v'imru amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shemaya v'chaim aleinu ve'al ko Yisrael v'imru amen. Ose shalom b'imramav v'yase shalom aleinu ve'al ko Yisrael v'imru amen. Thank you, Rabbi Jeff and Jerry. Now. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mary Ann Byrne.
is it done? Yes. Okay, thank you. I am very glad and grateful to have this opportunity to talk about the so-called Kristallnacht, or Crystal Night, of November 1938. Can you hear me, everybody? As events become history, it is all the more important, especially for eyewitnesses, to keep the memories alive. To put the Kristallnacht into perspective, we must remember that at that time, Hitler had been in power for over five years. The number of Jews in Germany at, at, uh, who were about 500,000 in 1933 had greatly diminished, and they had already been deprived of most of their rights. Doctors, lawyers, and other professionals were barred from practicing. Jews were not allowed to enter universities, concerts, theaters, as well as many hotels and restaurants. They had lost their citizenship, and of course, there was a ban on intermarriage. My father could no longer practice law after about 1935, despite his previous military service. We children could not use the public pools and many other facilities. We were increasingly excluded. If you wonder why didn't the Jews just leave, the answer is, where to? Most of the other countries had very strict immigration laws with endless formalities, all kinds of requirements, and sometimes years of waiting. By that time, German emigrants were no longer permitted to take any money along, and nobody wanted penniless refugees. It also needs to be mentioned that the Jews in Germany after World War I were probably the most assimilated and integrated group of Jews anywhere. They had, of course, fought in the war, and many, including my father, received an Iron Cross and other honors. My father lived in the same house in which I was born some 50 years later. And his family had lived in the town of Bielefeld in the province of Westphalia or the surrounding area for several hundred years. When the synagogue was built and dedicated in 1905, my father's uncle was the president of the congregation, and my father followed him after World War I. <coughs> the Jews became a very active part of the new democratic state until the arrival of Hitler changed everything. And the Jews, once again, were the convenient scapegoats for anything negative. The events of the Kristallnacht were triggered by the assassination only a few days earlier of a German diplomat in Paris, uh, 
uh, who uh, in Paris by a young Polish Jew, desperate because his parents had just been deported from Germany with thousands of other Polish Jews. This shooting, at least, was the official explanation for the spontaneous eruption of anger, as the Kristallnacht was called. In fact, the so-called spontaneous act was a well-planned, thoroughly organized government action against the Jews, carried out simultaneously in every town and, every, and village throughout Germany and Austria by stormtroopers and other Nazi personnel. During the night of November, from November 9th to 10th, 1938, synagogues everywhere were burned down, Jewish businesses and many homes shattered and looted, and thousands of Jewish men arrested and taken to concentration camps. The Jews were also forced to pay a huge collective penalty and to hand over their jewelry and other valuables. Also, from that moment on, Jewish children were no longer allowed to attend public schools. The Kristallnacht was a watershed event for the Jews still left in Germany. It shattered whatever illusions any of them might have had about survival in Nazi Germany. And people desperately tried to escape. My sister and I were able to leave for England on a kinder transport six months later in May of 39, just three months before the war started. We were luckier than most of the other children. Our parents were able to follow us shortly afterwards. The best part about leaving Germany was the feeling of freedom as soon as you crossed the border. All of a sudden, we did not feel like crawling into the ground to become invisible, but we were as good as everybody else. Well, we were still designated as friendly aliens with a nightly curfew. Even the bombing of London during the war was easier to bear because it affected everybody the same way. We could be air raid wardens or be on fire watch duty like everybody else. On that fateful night of Wednesday, November 9th, I had gone to our synagogue to practice the organ. When I had finished, I took my key, locked the door, and went home. Early the next morning, our live-in housekeeper, Esther, knocked on my door. Marianne, she said, the synagogue, the synagogue brennt. The synagogue is burning. I couldn't believe it having only just been there the night before. As I walked to school, I saw it right away. Sure enough, the synagogue was in flames, with crowds watching. The firemen sprayed water, but only on the surrounding buildings. Soon, only charred ruins remained. All that was left of our beautiful synagogue is one second.
Oh, I'm sorry. All that was left of our beautiful synagogue is this key. I would like to end with a poem that I wrote uh, some time ago on a trip through Germany. Germany, summer 2000. I think it was actually a little earlier than that. <coughs> Beautiful countryside, heather in bloom, emerald fields, lush, idyllic, shimmering birches, oak trees and elms, so calm and peaceful, like paintings by Gainsborough, Constable, Turner, and then a sign, Bergen-Belsen. All the horrors come surging back, visions of cattle cars, people in rags, shaven heads, hunger and death, despair beyond pity and tears. Unanswered questions, how, why, we thought the Dark Ages had ended centuries ago with their bigoted, murderous orgies, that now man was cultured, enlightened. But what happened here in our time <coughs> dwarfs the Crusades, Inquisitions, pogroms, and persecutions of the past. The more it recedes in time, the less can we comprehend such monstrous evil. No study, research, analysis will ever find an answer. Yet the sun rises, the birds still sing, and flowers blossom in the blood-soaked fields. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. I'm sure there are quite a few people who have questions, so maybe if people raise your hand, I'll just go one, two, three, four, and you could take turns. Uh, People with questions, could you put your hand up? Okay, one, two, and two for a start. Uh, the lady and then the gentleman. Um, have you written more, I just, you're very eloquent, and have you written at more at length about your experiences when you were growing up? I've you know, written and some and other uh, uh, recounts, accounts about it, yes. And in, in, at various times. Are they, is it possible to read them, or? I'm sorry? Is it possible to read them, or is it just? Well, uh, I, it's not really anything very uh, consecutive, and you know, uh, it's not a, a book or, or a lengthy story so far. <laughs> right. <coughs> Could you give us a chronology of what happened when and how you became aware of it? Like even before Hitler, as he was coming to power, how you got the first awareness? Of what at was what time? At when? At well, what? I mean, the, early, the earliest you can remember, going back to the beginning, how you, how people first became aware of things that were wrong with Hitler, and how the news got worse and worse, 
of in, in Germany. Yeah, well, because, because I, I've known families that you know, got out of there in 1933 as soon as you came. Well, um, it was, of course, uh, uh, developing uh, more and more, and uh, uh, it uh, it would uh, encroach us constantly more, you know, in in time. And uh, you could, uh, after some time, you you could you tried, however much you tried to ignore it, you couldn't. Because it, uh, it, uh, it entered your life, and and you just uh, had to pay attention to it, and and of course there also there were um, all kinds of new rules and regulations that were being issued uh, um, affecting the Jews, things that uh, they could no longer do or. Uh, so it it got uh, worse and worse as time went on, and and more and more rules and laws and regulations were being issued. Can you tell us what happened to your uncle's family? I'm sorry. Well, my parents. Oh, no. Your extended family. Oh, um, well, my parents, of course, were fortunate they, they um, uh, got out. Um, by the way, I didn't even mention um, one uh, the fact that my father, uh, after he could no longer practice law, he um, uh, worked uh, to help uh, Jews uh, get uh, make their way out, make their way elsewhere, and uh, he um, uh, uh, made a practice of that. He um, he was working to um, assist uh, people any way he could, and uh, he did that in his in his office and. Um, and um, uh, uh, people would come and consult him, and he would know all the rules and regulations and tell them and help them any way possible to uh, uh, arrange leaving the country, which was not an easy thing to do, and it was time consuming and everything. By the way, I should also tell you exactly what happened on the evening of uh, um, uh, uh, of the date that um, uh, of the Kristallnacht um, as I as I explained um, I um, uh, I wanted to, um, um, I'm sorry, um, did I want to tell you? Um, yes, um, I, I went to the, I think I, I, I did mention that I went to the, to the temple, to the synagogue, and, uh, and uh, stayed for an hour or so to practice the organ, and then I, took the key, locked up, and uh, went home. And of course, uh, I don't know if anybody had been waiting for me already to leave, but they, uh, uh, it didn't take them very long to uh, uh, get in there and uh, did what they had planned to do. And, and I must have been the last person in that building. It was a rather eerie feeling. Our video person has given me a portable mic so that the questions can be heard. So I'm going to run around the room to the people with their hands up and pretend I'm on one of those Q&A people. So bear with me. Well, my son is up. 
How? Uh, how old and what grade and school were you, did you go to? Yeah, when the crystal night happened. I'm sorry. What grade were you in? What grade in school? Uh, tenth, I believe. Tenth grade. I I was the I was sixteen at the time. I think I saw a couple of hands in the neighborhood. Have any recollection of being a child and asking your parents why this was happening? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do you have any recollection of being a child and asking your parents why this was happening and how they attempted to answer you? Do you understand the question? Uh, no, I did. You, did you ask your parents? Yeah. Why is all this happening? Oh and, no. And and. How did they try to explain it to you? Or it was pretty clear to you at your age? It was, it was more than clear to me. I had been uh, living with this already for years, and I was familiar with it. So it was nothing, nothing new or surprising. The, the mic is back here, but I can see your hand, so. Uh. Was the first indication that you that anything was wrong as far as Kristen knocked when you returned and saw the or was told that the synagogue was burning or were oh, there other much events? earlier much much long before that no no I, I meant that on yeah. that night yeah. did were other things going on in town were windows being broken out of Jewish businesses or anything oh, like yes. that oh yes 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 so you knew about oh the, sure mm -hmm. yes of course. Were, was your family home or relatives' homes damaged or people injured? At that time? Yeah. Uh, no, actually not. Oh, Ours was not, but uh, um, many others were. Businesses were looted and, and, uh, and houses were damaged and... Uh, um, uh, there were I mean, all kinds of things were, were happening at that time. And Thank people you. were simply uh, dragged from their homes and, uh, in, and sent to uh, concentration camps. And, and then uh, if they were lucky, they came back after several months, you know. Um, of course, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I was wondering, you apparently went back to Bielefeld some years ago. Did you go to the site where it happened and maybe to your uh, house where you lived before then? Sorry. Shall when I you, repeat when it? When you visited Germany, did yes. you go back to your hometown? Yes. Did you visit your, your home where you had lived previously? Well, as a matter of fact, I did, and it was a rather strange experience. It was, of course, uh, it had changed hands uh, uh, very much and it, it was uh, combined with the, the neighboring house and it had been bought by the city and turned into um, a home for uh, artists to uh, uh, rent apartments and um, uh, from the city and there were, oh, perhaps uh, 20 or 25 uh, different groups of people living in there, uh, uh, groups of artists. And um, uh, there were some whom I knew, whom I had met, and uh, went to visit there. So I did uh, get to see my old house again, our old house again. And um, I became very good friends with uh, uh, a couple of those people. And altogether, I have been uh, fortunate in, in that respect. I have a, a, a few of my old childhood friends 
have remained my friends. One, for instance, became a pianist, and uh, we are still friends to this day. They have seen each other again a number of times. She's come and visited me here, and I've been seeing her back there. And uh, there are some others who, that I'm in, still in touch with. How'd you end up in Iowa? How? Just good luck, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Just chance, really, really. Marion, I think the answer is, Marion, I think the answer is probably obvious. But these, these childhood friends that you were able to reconnect with on visits to Germany, these were not Jewish friends, no, I take it. No, they were not. Had they remained friendly with you yes. through the 30s to this until day. you... To this day. No, but as the anti-Jewish regulations yes. were being put into effect and you were barred from schools and yes. parks and yes. pools, did some of these friends dare to still be friendly with you until say, well, Kristallnacht, or until you left six months later? A few of later? them did. A few of them, in fact, uh, continued coming to our house, even, which was uh, something unusual and um, uh, rather uh, Exceptional. I mean, they—they. They, um, uh, it was an, an act of, of courage, really, because they risked, they risked. Um, uh, if if somebody had seen that or had uh, reported on them, it could have uh, had bad consequences. Now, I, I would like to tell you one quick, uh, short story about that. Um, on, I think, the day, a uh, couple of days before we were due to leave Germany, my hometown, I, did, I went downtown to do some last-minute errands, and I happened to meet an old friend, school friend, a, a very good friend. Uh, whom I hadn't seen in months. And uh, somewhat surprisingly, because it was not something to be taken for granted, uh, as we passed each other, she stopped and started talking to me. And we did. We talked for a little bit. And she said, uh, can I come and see you? So I said, well, if you want to come and watch me pack tomorrow, you're welcome. And she did. This was literally the day before we left. I was um, 16. And um, she came over and uh, watched me pack and stayed the whole afternoon, and we talked. And um, then, finally, she left. And as uh, I said goodbye to her at the door, she said, you know something? I wish I could go with you. I am sick and tired of everything here. Now, I tell you, this was, I was thunderstruck when I heard that. And I, I mean, she was the kind of person you would expect that to. She was very uh, uh, liberal minded and uh, artistically inclined, and, uh, and we had been good friends, but we had not uh, ever talked, uh, you know, uh, about issues or politics uh, that would have been 
dangerous. But I was very, very impressed when I heard that. And then, of course, the war uh, started very shortly after that, and uh, we were no longer in touch, couldn't be. But then we continued or, or picked up again after the war and again renewed our friendships and met again. And years later, I asked her once, tell me, did you tell your parents anything uh, about our meeting at the time? And she hesitated for a moment, and then she said, I told my mom. So I said, well, what did she say? She said, don't tell dad, don't tell dad. <laughs> so, you know, I could, uh, uh, that, said it all, and especially since her father was a, a teacher, school teacher, so he could certainly not take chances. But she herself always was and <coughs> remained a very broad-minded, uh, generous person and friend, and we've been friends literally to the very last day. She, as it happens, she died uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And we were in touch. I, I, um, I've been to visit her. She's been here. And we've been talking to each other uh, really till the last day. <laughs> Marianne, um, when did you become aware that this night of broken glass was not just happening in your town, but was all over Germany. I mean, now we have so much media, we find things out so fast. How was it then for you to find out that it was bigger than just your community? The, the, because it, it, <laughs> there was no question about it. There, there were, there were, uh, it, there were, everything was, um, ruled by by uh, um, laws, you know, and and rules and everything. There was no escape from it. And the only way you could uh, um, occasionally try and ignore it was by uh, such as uh, acts like that, where you simply paid no attention and uh, and defied the, the rules, you know. I think I saw a couple of hands. Okay, I saw your hand first. At the, uh, on the night of Kristallnacht, did you actually feel fear when you went to the synagogue or in your regular not daily life? Not when I life? went there, no. No, I, I, not really because there was no way I could ever have uh, foreseen anything of the kind. Just in your general daily life? No. When you went out? No. No. No, I did not, no. Good. And I didn't even, at that point, I had no idea that uh, we would no longer go to school the next day, which we, you know, obviously did not. But at, uh, on that particular day, earlier, we were still at school. And I mean, as normally as it had been, obviously there were, there were uh, strict limits to many things. We, there were many things we, uh, many uh, courses we could not participate in. So we only, uh, we were restricted to certain uh, parts only, no. Um, there's a footnote I think we ought to add. Um, 
the Quakers in Great Britain and the other groups that saved 10,000 Jewish children from all over Europe asked America to also take in some Jewish children, but the Roosevelt administration refused. And, um, and they also could have saved many thousands of children, but did not. I think that's a, really a black mark on this nation's history. I didn't know that. <clears throat> Did you live in an integrated area where Jews lived with Gentiles or Christians? Did I know what? Did, did, did you live where Jews and Gentiles were together? In your At neighborhood? At that time? Yes. yes. Um, no. No. I mean, the, it was no... Uh, there were certain areas, certain towns which were had... Uh, I don't know how to put that, I had uh, less of a bad reputation, if you will, uh, from our point of view than others. Some were less strict or, uh, than, than others. Just so happened, just chance. Uh, there was nothing, uh, uh, nothing um, that was, had been ruled or decreed or, or um, that was different from, from others. It just so happened that people were more, uh, w were less prejudiced perhaps than, but than in, your, in other areas. But in your immediate neighborhood, was your immediate neighborhood predominantly a Jewish neighborhood or were there there was no such thing. Okay, but there in in our town, uh, there was no Jewish neighborhood. Okay, so no. So in in your neighborhood, there were both Jews and Gentiles. Yes. Together in your yes. Up to that time, they they lived where they had always lived. Um, how did you feel when you saw the synagogue burning down? Um, how did you feel when you saw the synagogue um, burning down? When you saw the synagogue burning? Yeah. How did you feel about it? I don't think there's any way to explain that. Uh, I, it was a... Uh, it's something beyond explanation, beyond... Uh, uh, it, it was a... The, uh, the worst kind of shock, one imaginable. Something you could not understand, could not explain. Uh, and right away, of course, we didn't even know uh, what had brought that about, that it was an, that it, it was an organized uh, action all over, although it, uh, it was to be suspected, and uh, that it was much more far-reaching than it seemed at, the, at, at first. I thought I saw a hand on the side before. Yeah. This was, this was a time of great fear. Um, was the attitude at the time did the people fear the government? Obviously, the Jewish community feared the government. Did the general people fear the government, or did they feel like the government was saving them from something more fearful? They obviously would have feared any action that might have been taken against no matter who, anyone who had... Uh, um, done something that, that was not uh, licensed strictly or strictly uh, 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 agreed on, you know. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult to predict that ahead of time or, or know just how much uh, would have been tolerated. And it, it probably also depends on some individuals. As I, as I explained, that in, in some areas there were uh, 
the, the um, situation was uh, more st less strict than in others. The, the uh, um, uh, certain rules were, were inf enforced a great deal more uh, rigid, rigidly than, than others and in other areas. It, it, very, it depended very much on, on individuals and on uh, uh, a general attitude. Uh, I see a hand, and I'm going to ask two questions and then go over there, and it's going to be last chance to raise your hand, and then we'll break to informal questions and snacks. But Marianne, I have two questions. One, you said your family had been there for hundreds of years. Yes. So is there still a record of your family, or did the archives get destroyed, or are there, is there a record in the secular domain or graves or something that shows your family was there? I think there probably is. There, I think there might still be a. Um, I think there's still an old Jewish cemetery, and uh, where they, the the ancestors would be uh, included. And I know um, on the phone in planning this, at one point you told me that your town was a lot like Cedar Rapids. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit more what it was like and also about your early memories when things were good? Okay. You know, before, when things were better, when this Jewish community was flourishing. You know, what's the best you remember? The good part? Because I think we need to remember um, when we think about the Holocaust how incredibly rich Jewish culture was between the wars. At least that's what I think. Well, it it certainly was flourishing, and uh, it, act, it may have been one of the first periods when Jews really had the opportunity to develop uh, freely as much as they wished, and, uh, uh, and uh, enjoyed living with everybody else. Um, and, and which is what they did. And of course, they had been fighting in the war and uh, had, been, had won their, um, uh, their, their uh, laurels, so to speak. And um, uh, I think it was perhaps, perhaps the, the uh, time of most freedom for Jews in Germany, anywhere at any time uh, at, that, at that period. They could really develop the way they wished and, uh, and uh, cooperate with uh, everybody else, like everybody else, until the arrival of Hitler. And then, again, everything came to a screeching halt. I think the last hand I saw is the person right here. Hi. Thank you uh, for speaking today. I really appreciate your message and your story. Uh, my, my question is, uh, could you please talk about how uh, your family, your parents, were able to get out of Bielefeld and, and reunite with you in England? Well, uh, it was just uh, a lot of uh, good luck, for one thing. And of course, my father had been in the uh, business, so to speak. He had been uh, um, working for uh, Jews, individuals, and groups already um, for a number of years trying to reconnoiter the situation for them uh, outside and uh, uh, find the best opportunities for them. And uh, so, I mean, that, that went into all directions and it was a, a difficult thing to do, but he, he had been 
doing a, a lot of that for years. He started doing that in, uh, well, uh, around, as I mentioned, about uh, 35. And um, uh, when the need became more and more urgent for everybody, especially for young people, and um, so he had been looking around and uh, in, in many ways and, uh, and of course it finally benefited himself and his own family to uh, uh, follow that up and do as much as, as possible to find possibilities. I think everyone here would agree that Marianne uh, has earned a cup of tea and we have the room till five and I'd like to invite everyone who didn't get to ask their question or who wants to visit to please stick around. There are refreshments or there are things to look at and I would like to ask or beg Marianne as she never finishes the book to please let the unfinished bits of it remain in an archive. Um, the Iowa Women's Archive is very interested in materials of all women who've been in Iowa, and there are Jewish archives in New York. And I know, um, I confess, I am a fan, besides of Marianne, of her wonderful son. And when I heard that Marianne was moving, my little instinct went off, and I went to see Dan, and I said, I had a feeling you'd be sitting here in this house overwhelmed. And he said, I, w I am. And I said, I had a feeling you'd be sitting with all these boxes, not knowing what to do. And he said, you're right. And I said, I just have to tell you my four favorite words in the English language. Don't throw anything away. <laughs> and anyone who's visited my home will understand this sentiment. But I really think a lot of people, Marianne especially, uh, has a paper trail that is very important. And since I mentioned her son, um, he is Dan Byrne. He's a singer, songwriter, and an artist who had an art opening. And to me, his music and his lyrics embody the voice of the next generation. He wrote a song to his sister that has an incredible line, you explained me to our parents. English wasn't their first language. They spoke German, hated Germans, confusing times. So I'd invite you to um, go to our website. There's a link to more information about Marianne's town besides this lovely photograph that my dearly beloved found of the synagogue, which we can see is quite beautiful. There's information about the town so you can, if you're not going to Germany, you can still visit it. And uh, you can also visit, go to danburn.com and see what Marianne's son is up to. And hope to see more of all of the Byrne family as the years go by. It's been a pleasure having Marianne here and um, I'm sure we're all very grateful. Thank you and we all thank you. Thank you.